person. We're going to do an acapella to start. It's just a really, really good song. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should I shout?
our Heavenly Father can take care of the birds in the air and cover the fields with lilies, how much more do you think that he cares for his children? That's what that song's about. If he keeps his eye on the one sparrow, how much more do you think God takes care of his children? If you belong to him, no matter whatever your situation in life is, it has its ups and downs, no one can ever snatch you out of his hand. That's, that's what we rest, that's what our faith is in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as we gather together to celebrate that once we are yours, we can never not be yours. That if you keep your eye on one single sparrow that you've created for your glory, how much more shall we rest in the comfort that you love and care for your children? Life's not always easy. It has its difficulties, bad health, sicknesses, diseases, but we rest in the comfort that once we belong to you, no one can ever take us away from you. We look forward to your kingdom. And before we come into your kingdom, we'll gather each and every week to praise and worship the one who has saved us from sin and death, the one who has rescued us from eternal judgment. So until we come into your kingdom, we'll come and celebrate the one who gave us life that we might be able to. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't think we have much announcements. We've already got everything covered. Um, please be seated. I don't, not a whole lot going on. Um, if you missed yesterday, you missed it. We had a good time. Thanks to Roger and Kathy for having us out to their place. A good time of fellowship. Um, we weren't we weren't keeping track of score from what I'm told. Some people did participate because they were afraid that I was going to call them out behind the book. The guy with the microphone and with the live stream. Uh, it's fearful for a lot of people. They didn't want anything to do with it. They were afraid I was going to call you out. But, uh, it was a good time. Thanks for everybody for coming. Um, thanks again for Roger and Kathy that for having us. We'll have to we'll have to do that uh, more often. Uh, Veterans Day coming up this Friday. We're always thankful and grateful for the men and women who have served our country that we might have the freedom to gather this morning and worship without any fear of, uh, from government in interference. So. Thanks to all who serve. Thanks for all. There's many of us in here that still know those who are still serving. So we thankful for them. We pray for them who are uh, standing on the walls, uh, protecting our freedoms this this very moment. Our Bible study coming up on Wednesday at seven o'clock. Invite everybody as we continue to go through the Book of Genesis. That's all the announcements we've got. Get back to worship.
держится. Bible in Luke chapter 6 verses 37 through 42. One of the most controversial subjects in Christianity judging one another or at least by its definition when we think of judging one another we think of someone standing sitting behind a, a chair with as the judge jury and executioner condemning somebody for their faults, but that's not necessarily how the word is translated here. It's the definition between right and wrong, between good and evil. It's also one of the most misunderstood topics in all of Scripture, even among Christians. Christians aren't quite sure what to make of it. It was R.C. Sproul, I think, who said it. I, I paraphrase that every pagan in the world knows at least one scripture and it's the one that we're going to cover today don't judge me for some sin that you're perceiving in my life you're not supposed to pass judgment on me it says it right there in the bible they go right to the scriptures that they have zero belief in and then quote it to you judge not lest you be judged and anytime a non-believer feels that they're being criticized or confronted or condemned for their behavior, they quickly quote the scripture, don't judge me. You're not supposed to pass judgment on me. We understand why the outside world doesn't understand this text or any text for that matter. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Paul says the natural person, those who are still dead in their trespasses and sins, those who do not believe in God or his word, they don't accept the things of God. They don't accept that this is his word, that it has any authority whatsoever. In fact, Paul says... It's ridiculous to them. It's folly. Nonsense. The same thing he said back in 1 Corinthians 1.18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. God and his word, all of this is just foolishness. It doesn't even make any sense. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The natural person does not accept the things of God or foolishness to him. They cannot understand him because unable to understand God's word, you have to have spiritual discernment. You must be born again. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Of everyone who lives in the world today, only those who are born again Christians know the truth. Everyone else lives a lie. Satan is the father of lies and he has led the world into his lies. Only those who have the spiritual discernment to know what the Christian Bible says are the only people to understand and know what truth is. The spiritual person judges all things, Paul says. This is talking about between right and wrong. 
what's good and evil. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon who said, I don't want to misquote, but I think it was Spurgeon who said, spiritual discernment is not the ability to be able to tell what's right and wrong. It's the ability to be able to tell what's right from what's almost right. And that's how Satan works. He doesn't tell you something completely wrong. He tells you something that's almost right. It sounds so much like the truth that it must be to the truth. When he tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he quoted scripture. He misquoted it, but he told something that was almost the truth. Spiritual discernment is not between what's true and untrue. It's what's true and what's almost true. The spiritual person judges all things, but has in himself to be judged by no one. And then Paul asks a rhetorical question that's still there in 1 Corinthians 2.16. For who has understood the mind of the Lord as to instruct him? Who can understand that the Lord to the point that they have the ability to give his instructions. Of course, it's rhetorical. Paul answers it. We have the mind of Christ. Us, those who are born again, should understand the mind of the Lord. Same thing he tells the Philippians. Have this same mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We should have the same mind in us that Jesus has. And when we do, then we have the ability to tell others and instruct others about him. So we understand why the natural person, the non-believer, misinterprets this text. It's because they have no spiritual discernment. The question really is, is why do so many Christians misinterpret this text? Why do we have such a misunderstanding of what Jesus means here? Hopefully we'll be able to clear some of those misconceptions up this morning on this subject when we talk about judging one another. Luke chapter 6 verses 37 to 42. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? The disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck that's in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that's in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to take the speck that's in your brother's eye. So back in verse 37 and 38, judge not, you will not be judged, condemn not, you will not be condemned, forgive, you will be forgiven, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you use it will be measured back to you. <coughs> so many people stop right there at 37a. Judge not, and you will not be judged. And then they build their entire doctrine on judging based on this one sentence. See, it says right there, judge not, case closed. Well, before we close the case, we need to ask ourselves a couple of questions here. Anytime that you come across something in scripture where you're not quite sure what it means, ask yourself, is, is this particular subject or topic covered anywhere else in the Bible? If it is, look at those things and see how it's perceived elsewhere. And if it clears it up for you, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But before you bring an interpretation to Scripture, first let the Scriptures interpretate the Scripture. Scripture always interprets Scripture. It never contradicts itself. Sometimes it's not always crystal clear, but that's where spiritual discernment comes in as well. But the more that you cross-reference it, with similar or like topics in the Bible, you have a better understanding on how something should be interpreted. So that's why when it comes to this subject of judging, we shouldn't be confused. It's covered multiple times in the Bible, and when we read all of them, we should be able to come away with a pretty firm conclusion on what it means here. We can't just read verse 37a and then stop. Judge not, and you will not be judged. If we just take that second part into consideration 
and you will not be judged. If we take everything that we know in the Bible that it says about judgment, are we then led to believe that if we go our entire lives without ever judging anyone else, then we will end up in the end not being judged? If we take everything we know, is that the conclusion that we come up with? And the answer is no. So then we know that that's not what it means here. The pronouncement of God's judgment on evil is not only permitted, it is required by the followers of Christ. So we're going to take a look at a few scriptures. You're going to get some exercise this morning. We're going to look at books you didn't even know that was in the Bible. I didn't even know that book was in the Bible. <laughs> we'll start in chronological order. We'll go back to Leviticus, look at a few. The battery in the clock doesn't work in the back, so we're going to work this morning with no understanding of what time it is, which is good because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Leviticus 19, 15, just quickly. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness so you judge your neighbor. So when it comes to even in court, when we do something, make sure that it's just, that there is no injustice on the way that we do something, and that it's not partial. This, same, it's, this partial is said over and over again throughout all of scripture when it comes to judgment. If you read the first couple of chapters of James, that's what he says, don't be partial with one another. The same thing that it says here between someone who's poor or great, don't make a decision on your own just because of somebody's wealth or what their prominent position within the community is of how you're gonna treat them versus you treat someone else. No, it says in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Do it impartially. If you know that someone is in sin and they're leaving, leaving an immoral life and you want to bring the scripture to them in order for them to repent and come to Christ, and you have two people that do the exact same thing. One is your friend and the other one's not. You don't ignore what your friend is doing and they go tell someone else that they need to repent and rebuke them. No, go to both of them. Don't show partiality because you know someone or you like someone. If you're going to bring a judgment, make sure that it is in partial, that it's done in righteousness, and that it's done justly. I'll jump over to the New Testament real quick before we come back to the Old, to John chapter 7, is because Jesus says the exact same thing that's being said here. Whether he's quoting it or paraphrasing it, in John chapter 7, the first half of chapter 7, Jesus is going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Booths, he's preaching. And again, there's always a controversy on what he does on the Sabbath day. So again, he's confronting these hypocrites because they always point out what they perceive he's doing wrong, while at the same time, Jesus is always pointing out what they are actually doing wrong. He says it here, he said it in other places, I think we even covered it a couple of weeks ago, when they're talking about there's no work to be done on the Sabbath, when Jesus points out that every single priest in the temple, if we interpret it that way, they are then breaking the Sabbath because they're working in the temple, still working, doing sacrifices. So he uses this example of circumcision. The law of Moses says that a male had to be circumcised on the eighth day. No matter what day that eighth day fell on, if it fell on the Sabbath, so be it. So that's what Jesus uses as an example there in verse 23, John 7. If on the seventh Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a whole man's body well? That should have been enough to end the conversation right there. If you're telling me that a priest can work on the Sabbath to perform a circumcision, then why are you criticizing me that I can heal a whole man's body on the Sabbath? So Jesus says there in verse 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Again, appearances, partiality. Don't tell me what I'm doing wrong when you're standing there doing the exact same thing 
that I'm doing. You don't want to criticize yourself. You don't want to criticize anyone else. You're picking and choosing on what you think is or is not permitted on the Sabbath. So Jesus says that don't not judge by appearances. He doesn't say don't judge. He says just do it with right judgment. That when you bring rebuke or judgment upon someone, make sure that you're doing it impartially and with righteousness. The same thing that Leviticus 19 shows. So we'll jump back in the Old Testament, Ezekiel. Find the middle of the Bible, and you'll be pretty close. Find the middle, go right, turn right. After, yeah, don't take a left. After Isaiah, you'll come to Ezekiel 33. Begin in verse 9. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from among them and make him their watchman, if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone hears the sound of the trumpet, does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning, his blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So the watchman, a city, you build a city, then you build a wall around it. And the watchman would stand on the wall. Sometimes they would build a tower. The watchman would stand upon the wall or upon that tower. Their job was to stare out on the horizon and look for any impending danger, the enemy approaching. When they saw danger coming, they would sound the alarm. They'd blow the trumpet and let everyone know that danger was coming. If he did that and people didn't do anything about it and they themselves got themselves killed, well, then God says that's their problem. However, if the watchman sees the danger coming and does not warn everybody and those people get killed, and God says that I'm going to come and blame the watchman. So now he uses that same content in verse 7 as he speaks to Ezekiel as the watchman. Now when we come into the New Testament under the New Covenant, we are all this watchman because Jesus has given each one of us the responsibility to go and make disciples of all nations. He doesn't choose, pick and choose certain people. You don't need to be in ordained ministry or pastoral ministry or full-time ministry. If you are in Christ, he has called each and every one of us to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that he has said. Ezekiel 33, now in verse 7. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them a warning from me. We have every word from God's mouth that we're going to have. We have his full revelation in our hands this morning. So when he gives them a warning, if he says to the wicked, O wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. So God uses the analogy of the watchman. He has given us his word to warn the wicked of impending judgment. This should bring a little bit of fear and trembling to each one of us. Our job is to warn the world of the impending judgment. Danger is coming. God says if we do that and they choose to live the life they want to live and then come under judgment, God says that's their problem. I'll deal with them. However, if we don't warn them of the judgment to come, God says I'm going to hold you accountable for not doing what I've told you to do that should have fear and trembling in each one of our lives. 
when we come born again Christians, that's not a, a ticket, a get out of hell free card where we're able to kick up our feet and just live the luscious life for the rest of our lives. No, we have been called as his servants to do what he tells us to do. And part of our job is to go and tell the world of this gospel that if they do not repent from their sins and turn to Christ, they are going to face the judgment to come. Our job is to do that. Over in the New Testament, in Luke 17, in verse 3, Right, the same gospel that we're just coming this morning where Jesus says, Judge not unless you be judged. In chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus says, Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If someone is sinning and in living an immoral life, rebuke them, correct them. Tell them they must turn from their sin and turn to God. And if that person repents, then forgive them. That's the whole purpose of giving them God's word, of bringing a rebuke, is to get the person to repent of their sin and turn to God. If they do that, then stop rebuking and start recycling. But we are, make no doubt about it, to tell people when they are out of line with God's word. Over in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus that we went through last year about this time. Ephesians 5, we'll pick it up there in verse 5. Paul says, For you may be sure of this. That means you shouldn't have any doubt. This would be like God saying, thus saith the Lord, when Paul is saying that, you can be sure of this, what I'm about to tell you is 100% accurate. Everyone, not some, not maybe a couple of few here and there, every single one who is sexually immoral, who is impure, covetous, idolatrous, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That's the warning. Ephesians 5, 5, verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words because of these things. The whole world is full of deceit, of empty words. The whole world will now tell you that's nonsense. God loves each and every one of you, no matter what you do. God doesn't care who you have any kind of sexual relationship with, whether if it's the same sex or opposite sex or someone who doesn't know what sex they are or sex inside of marriage, outside of marriage. What is God, what business of that is God? You think he cares what you do in the privacy of your own bedroom? That's what the world, not just the world, there's people behind the pulpits preaching that very thing this very moment. God loves you exactly who you are, exactly where you're at. Paul says, let no one deceive you with those empty words. The same thing he writes to the Galatians. If anyone else comes preaching a different gospel than this, then let that person be accursed. Because Paul says, no, it's because of those very things that judgment and wrath are coming. It's because of the sexually immoral. It's because of the impure, those who have a life of covetousness and live a life of idolatry. It's because of these things that the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were, that's what he says back in, remember back in chapter 2, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins, following after the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air. We were all sons of disobedience, but God, being rich in mercy with the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. So therefore, Paul says, if you are alive then together with Christ, you're no longer living in darkness. Instead, you are living in the light. So walk as children of light. 
for the fruit of light is found in all that's good and right and true. And try to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. All you have to do is read the scripture. You will be able to discern what's pleasing to the Lord. He tells you. He does not hide from you what's pleasing to him. Verse 11. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. When you expose them, do you perceive that you're going to be bringing a judgment upon somebody? You better believe it. Expose the works of darkness, because it's of those things that wrath and judgment are coming. We are the watchmen. Sound the alarm and blow the trumpet that wrath and judgment are coming upon these people, that they must repent from these things and turn to Christ. Take no part, expose the deeds of darkness. In 1 Timothy 5, as Paul writes to his young protege Timothy, he turns to the elders of the church that no one is above being rebuked if they're out of line, whether they're the elder or the pastor of the church, if they're in sin, then call them out. Verse 17, that the elders who rule well, first he begins with the positive. The elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when he treads off the grain. The labor deserves his wages. Now he turns to the negative. Do not admit a charge against an elder. Just because somebody's an elder doesn't mean they can't be rebuked of sin in their life. But Paul does give a warning. If you're going to do it, because if you do it, it's going to make a fracture in the church. So if you do it, make sure you've got two or three witnesses. Make sure that it's done justly, that it's done in righteousness. But you still do it. In verse 20, if they still persist in sin, in sin then rebuke them in front of everybody. So church discipline always takes place behind closed doors until it doesn't. You don't do it in front of everybody at the beginning, but it says this person who continues to persist in sin, the same thing that Jesus teaches when it comes to church discipline, you try to handle it, take someone with you to handle it, take another person with you to handle it, but if it's, they still persist, persist in sin, then call them out in front of everybody. Maybe that's what it will take for them to come back into line with Christ. So if you're going to do this with an elder of the church, then certainly you can do it with anyone in the church and outside of the church. No one is above being rebuked because of their sin. Second Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. Speaking of judgment, there's only one judge, and he will judge everyone. When he appears in his kingdom, Paul tells Timothy to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. And what does this word do? This word, when you tell any, when you share your gospel with anybody, this is what it does. It will reprove them, correct them. It will rebuke them. It will exhort, but do it with complete patience and teaching. God's word, anytime that you speak it, will, is going to bring rebuke upon someone. That's what it does. Because God's word is sharp. God doesn't beat around the bush. He says what he says, and he means what he says. And sin is a sin, whether you like it or agree with it or not. It will rebuke and exhort. Why do we have to do this? Because Paul says in verse 3, the time is coming. I'm going to go out on a limb and say the time has already come. When people will not endure sound teaching. They won't endure sound doctrine. Instead, they'll have for them itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Whatever their passions were, all the way back to Ephesians 5, their passions are sexual immorality, covetousness, idolatrous. So they'll hire the guy who will stand behind the pulpit and tell them that all those things are okay. You're okay. God loves you. 
You're in the fear of nothing but living that kind of life. Just do good, be good, give to charity, put some money in the plate as we pass it around. They'll accumulate teachers for themselves, suit their own passions. They'll turn away from the truth. They'll wander off into myths. Paul says, but as for you, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Our ministry is our watchman. Sound the alarm. Blow the trumpet. Tell people they must repent of their sin and turn to Christ. That's what each and every one of our ministries is. Over in Acts chapter 13, I will just give a quick example. So in Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey. They're on the island of Cyprus as they travel through. Paul's preaching. He comes across this magician who is opposed to Paul and his preach because Paul is preaching and leading the pro-council, the guy who's in charge of the whole island. And Paul's leading him into the gospel. He's leading him to Christ. This magician that has kind of his grips in the pro council doesn't like it, so he begins to oppose Paul. He opposes the gospel, so Paul takes a moment, takes his breath, and begins to remember what Jesus says, Judge not, lest I be judged. So I can't be judgmental when I speak to this guy. I better, I don't want to say anything to hurt his feelings, or something that's going to upset him so I'll be gentle and kind to this guy who is opposing the gospel there in verse 10 Paul turns to the magician and says you son of the devil you enemy of all righteousness full of all deceit and villainy will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord you think Paul was bringing judgment on that guy you better believe he was. The guy needed it and deserved it. He was opposing the word of God. He's opposing the gospel. God, Paul is trying to lead somebody to Christ. This man is interfering. Now, when we do it, do we always have to be as sharp as Paul does it? Of course not. We do it with gentleness and meekness and fear when we lead people to the gospel until we don't. Sometimes you have to be direct. Paul didn't want to be around the bush, direct. I think that guy said, judge not. Jesus said, judge, don't judge me. So Paul rebuked that man in front of everyone because that man was against God, against his Christ, against his gospel. And Judges, I won't turn there, but in Judges chapter 21, verse 25, that's the last verse in the book of Judges. Judges 21, 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They had no king. We live in a world that's very similar today. To the world, there is no king. There is no God. And since there is no king and there is no God, everybody does what's right in their own eyes. But we know that there is a king because that's whom we serve. And it's our responsibility to tell them that they cannot do everything that's right in their own eyes. They must do what's right in God's eyes. And it says it right here in this book that they must repent from their sin and surrender their lives to Christ. Judge not and you will not be judged. Once we read the rest of that passage, we see that Jesus Interpret, he pretty much interprets what that means for us the rest of the way. This judgment or this condemnation is what he's getting to, where we are to correct and rebuke, to judge and exhort others in their sinful ways in order to turn them from condemnation. We are not the judge, jury, and executioner where we condemn people. That's not our place. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. Christ did not come to condemn, nor should we. That's not our place. However, we are to warn the world of the coming common condemnation. We do that by proclaiming the truth and calling sin for what it is, sin. 
We are the watchmen. We are responsible for telling the people that destruction is approaching. And again, it's also a warning against partiality, as we saw in a couple of the verses we looked at. Who are we most partial against? Number one, all right, ourselves. The most partial person we are with is ourselves. We have the tendency to criticize and find faults in others while ignoring the exact same sin in our own life, which is essentially the meaning behind the two parables that Jesus tells here. Forgive, you will be forgiven. We almost remember that the purpose behind judgment and being rebuked is to bring someone to repentance. And if they repent, then forgive them. Stop rebuking, start discipling. We forgive as God forgives us, just like we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. And this is all done in connection with verse 36. To be merciful as our Father in heaven is merciful. We imitate him. He forgives. We forgive. He's merciful. We act merciful. And when we do, he rewards in good measure. To rebuke, lead to people and do right judgment, to forgive them, and then give to them in good measure. Same way that we measured back to you. Jesus gives an example from the marketplace of someone filling a sack of grain. Don't be the guy who folds the top six inches of the sack down and then puts a little bit of grain in it and hands it in. He says, no, when you fill that sack, shake it so some of that grain fills in all those empty pockets. Press it down and keep filling it. Keep pressing it down until it overflows from the top. God loves a cheerful giver. The best illustration I could come up with is don't be like the potato chip people. <laughs> the bag is this big and there's that many chips. Five dollar bag, there's that much chips in this bag. Don't be like those. That same measure that they measure out, they're going to be measured when they stand before God, those potato chip people. When they stand in judgment, that same measure that they gave out all those years of potato chips that I got and coming back measure to them. Don't be like that. Don't be one third given and two thirds full of hot air. Give generously. Verse 39 and 40. Again, I don't have a clock, so it makes no difference to me what time it is. <laughs> he also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? Disciples not above his teacher, for everyone he when he's fully trained, will be like his teacher. So Jesus tells two parables. And as you can see, as both of them, the other one has to do with the, the log and the speck. We see Jesus has a sense of humor. Can blind people lead other blind people? If the watchman on the tower was blind, what good is that going to do anybody? If a blind person was in need of an escort through town, would you then give them another blind person in order to escort them through town? So if we're going to lead people to the truth, we must first know what that truth is. If we're going to judge others and rebuke others and their actions and behaviors, then we need to be practicing what we're preaching. People who are on the road of destruction can only lead other people down the road to destruction. The same way that a blind person will lead another blind person right into the ditch. Don't be blind to your own faults before attempting to point out the faults in others. We're all hypocrites to some degree. We can never live up to what Scripture calls us to be as perfect as He is perfect, but we should not be complete hypocrites. The disciple's not above his teacher. When he's fully trained, he'll be just like his teacher. We have the responsibility as his disciples to be fully trained, and no one can do that except for you. 
through your own reading and your own study, through coming to Sunday and on Wednesday. That's how you're discipled. That's up to you. Nobody can come and drag you out of your house and make you be discipled. If you're going to be a fully trained disciple, then you have to take responsibility of your discipleship. If you come, we'll disciple you. We'll teach you. To be fully trained, our goal is to be just like him, to imitate him. He is our example to follow. And when we are trained like him, we know the truth. We have the same mind in us, which is also in Christ Jesus. That's the goal. We know the truth. We're not blind to it. Therefore, we can lead those who are blind into the truth. And then Jesus tells them the other parable with the log and the speck. And how does it end? It ends with someone giving judgment. So we understand that verse 37 doesn't mean judge not and then stop. That's what it means. No, if you read the whole section, it ends with the parable of Jesus saying, take the log out of your eye and then you'll be able to see the speck in someone's eye. That if you're going to do it, make sure it's done justly and righteously. 41, 42, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? How can you see a brother? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck that's in your eye and you yourself do not see the log that's in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to take the speck that's out in your brother's eye. Again, sense of humor. So we have one man who has a speck. This means a piece of sawdust, so minuscule that it's even hardly noticeable. You have to be standing eye to eye with the guy with a magnifying glass just to even see that it's there. If he was standing on the other side of the room, you wouldn't notice it. And then we have the other guy who has a log sticking out of his eye, a log, a beam, or a plank, however it's interpreted your translation. The idea here is that no matter where this guy stands, you can see him a mile away. So Jesus says, picture this. There's this man with a log sticking out of his eye, walking down the street. And he approaches this other guy. And he says, hey brother, come over here. So I can tell you and rebuke you about the speck that you have in your eye. And the other guy replies and says, how can you even see the speck in my eye? With the log that's sticking out of yours, you can't even see anything, let alone a speck. <clears throat> How about you first go home and take the log out of your own eye and then come back and see whether or not I even have a speck of sawdust in my own eye. All right, sometimes humor gets the point across. The pronouncement of God's judgment upon evil is not only permitted but it is required from his followers. However, make sure you're not the blind leading the blind. Make sure you don't have a log sticking out of your own eye when you go try to correct someone else that only has a speck. Jesus isn't saying don't do it, period. Of course we do it, or else how will the world know? If we don't tell the world to repent, then how will they know? If we don't point out their sin, or immorality, then they would not know. But when you do it, just make sure that you know what you're talking about. Make sure you know the truth that you're trying to lead them to. A true disciple is fully trained. A disciple who hears and does. So if we only hear and then do not do, and then we go admonish someone else who doesn't hear and do, then we're just a hypocrite. Blind guides telling other people about their specs while we have our own planes. This whole Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain, as it's called here in Luke, Jesus is describing the attributes and the characteristics of his own disciples, and it culminates in a couple of weeks in verses 46 through 49 with the two builders, those who hear and do. Jesus says, true disciples not only hear, but they do. And what we've heard is to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. We've heard that. The question is, have we done that? Are we doing that? 
We're to proclaim his word in season and out of season. And that word will reprove, rebuke, and exhort. It will judge the actions of others. And it's supposed to. That's what God's word is supposed to do. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and active. We can just stop there. God's word's not dead. It's not just black and white words on pages of a book. God's word is a living. It is alive and it is active. It is doing something. It's doing what he calls it to do. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's not like a pocket knife where it's got a sharp side and the other side's dull. No, it will cut you coming and going. And it pierces the division of the soul and spirit. It will cut you right in half. It will cut the soul right out of your body. It will cut the spirit right out of your body, all the way down to the joints and the marrow. It will split you in two. And for what reason does God's word does this, do this? To discern the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God's word will cut you right in half and it will see everything that's on the inside of you. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, it makes no difference. Because it says in verse 13, no creature is hidden from the sight. God's word, no one hides from God's word. But we are all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Picture that if somebody beat you and stripped you and left you naked in the parking lot of GNW right over there off Washington as the Sunday crowd arrives. You'd be embarrassed and ashamed, looking for a place to run to and to cover up with. Now times that by a million when you walk into the presence of God naked and exposed. He sees everything that's on the inside to whom we must give an account. As watchmen, we will give an account. Did we sound the alarm? Did we warn others of the judgment to come? If we did, then the onus is on them. We've done our job. We can only lead them to the truth. After that, it's between them and God. And for God's word to pierce their heart and cut them in two. If we did not, or if we do not, then we're held accountable. We are in dereliction of duty. The watchman only had one person, one purpose. Sound the alarm. If they did not sound the alarm and people perished, it was because of the watchman. And then the watchman was held accountable for their actions. The next time someone says to you, don't judge me, the Bible says right there, who are you to judge me? Who are you to tell me what's right and wrong or what's good and evil? Who are you to tell me what sin is or sin isn't? Don't judge me. Just say to them, it's better that I do it now than God do it to you later. I'm not here to judge you, but I am here to warn you of the judgment to come. That's what our responsibility is. It's not a comfortable, this isn't a comfortable topic. It's not a comfortable discussion. Some, a lot of times we need to do it with gentleness and meekness and fear. And then other times we just gotta say what needs to be said. This is Paul told the magician in Acts 13. Say what you gotta say. We don't have to be that sharp. We don't have to be jerks about it. But we are to tell people that there is a king and we're not allowed to do whatever we want in our own eyes that we must repent of our sins see the faults that we have in ourselves repent of them and turn to him Let's pray father we thank you for this time that we have this morning we know that some of these topics that we cover are difficult for us even read and hear, let alone to go out and implement it into our own life. But this is what we're called to do. At some point in our life, someone rebuked us. 
Our sin was exposed. We were naked and ashamed. But we don't even remember that now because we've been born again. You know, we've been fully clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Just like the birth, birth pains of a woman during the time of childbirth, it's painful. But once that child comes into the world, the pain is no longer remembered. All we see is the, the glory and the, the beautiful life that's in front of us. We pray for the courage to share the gospel with those who need to hear it. That they are on the road to destruction and that one day they're going to enter the wrong gate. Help us sound the alarm. Help us blow the trumpet. Help us warn them of the judgment to come that you've already prepared in their own hearts. That your living and active word has already pierced their hearts in preparation for the word that we have for them. Fill us with your word. Fill our hearts and minds with it. Fill our mouths with it. And we might tell someone else about it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We must repent and come to Christ. And after that, it's not the life of luxury. We don't kick our feet up and it's smooth selling. No, we're born again. We have a new life that's in front of us. And we are his servants. <coughs> he's the king. And he's given us his word to go tell everybody else. Each and every one of us knows someone who needs this word. We, we pray that we have the confidence and the courage to give it to them. If you have any questions about salvation, baptism, anything that you need to discuss about this morning or any other time, would you like to meet with you after service? If not, we'll have everybody to please stand. We're going to worship through song one more night, one more time. We'll see everybody Wednesday at 7 for uh, as we study Genesis. If not, we'll see you back 9.30 for Sunday school, 10.30 for worship next Sunday.